Hi and welcome to another episode of Boston Media Theory. My name's Marcus Breen. This is a program where we examine and think about how media and communication is, is explored and researched and taught in and around the city of Boston. Uh, tonight I'm delighted to welcome somebody who's a colleague of mine from Boston College, Kim Garcia. Kim is a poet and she'll be talking to us about a number of ideas that might on their surface appear somewhat unrelated to theories of media and communication, but of course are central to the long history of human interactions with each other. Uh, those interactions of course have become very machine mediated in uh, the last 50 years, but certainly I'm interested in investigating if we can how poetry plays a role in our thinking about media and communication. Mm. And uh, the uh, theoretical aspects of that might be uh, worth investigating. So I'm delighted to have a colleague from Boston College here, and I'm delighted to have you here, uh, Kim, to, uh, to explore some of these ideas. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, one of the uh, ways that we can start this conversation is to think about uh, this fascinating set of opportunities in relationships in uh, interdisciplinary research and yes. work. Uh, Boston College has a focus increasingly on liberal arts and humanities education, and so humanities, English, poetry, uh, the investigation of what it means to be human is very central to the project there. And uh, what's fascinating to me about that is that in the history of technology in particular in this country, there's been a, a, an important relationship between technology and culture. Uh, a couple of years ago, maybe 2011, a guy called Fred Turner put out a book called, uh, what was it called? It was called uh, From Counterculture to Cyberculture. I knew that, <laughs> I just had to look at my notes again. <laughs> and he made the point that uh, there's a, a very clear connection in the 1960s and 70s, on the West Coast in particular, between culture, counterculture, uh, if you like, sometimes called the hippie sort of scene, mm -hmm. uh, and the politics of the new left and that this convergence of a range of interests uh, continued in a, a quite unique formation mm -hmm. into uh, computerization and into uh, the uh, cyber culture. Uh, and so uh, his argument, Fred Turner's argument, is that art has, has and continues to have a central role mm -hmm. in how we think about ourselves in our relations to machinery, in relation to m media, and certainly in the history of communication. Mm. And so that sort of partly foregrounds my thinking about this, but also I wanted to uh, foreground your interest in this and how we came to meet, which, were, which was, how we, how we met I should say, which was really about your interest in drones and my interest in drones and their use um, for warfare by the US military. Yes. And your work on drones at that time and, mm. and uh, your research on the topic and then writing poetry about that seemed to me to be a very uh, exciting intersection mm. of the high advances, uh, m maybe we could call them low advances, but the high advances of uh, the US military and the research and computerization industry mm. and uh, the intersection then with your commentary as a poet. And so I wanted to let you begin, uh, as you so kindly offered before we started, to read Surely. a couple of your new poems about drones and yes. then we can talk more at length about where uh, this all fits together. Yes, wonderful. Well, um, it's interesting that you mentioned already this question of precision and, you know, uh, the ways in which we are, we, we are uh, able to do so much more, but at the same time the meaning for why we do what we do continues mm -hmm. to be less carefully explored. And that is the area where I think poetry offers a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, I, this first poem I'd like to read is called Predator and it has to do with this question of naming because of course we've uh, given the drones or the remotely piloted aircraft uh, names and one of them is Predator. Predator. When was I not creating this, these blind machines, these mechanical can we say this, warriors? All my life I've wanted the bombs to fall somewhere else. Wanted to dodge the bullet, skip the hard bits, avoid the crash. 
This sci-fi dream, go-kart motor, Klingon nose spatulate, it's a movie. Lasers, heat-seeking scopes, deadly accuracy. Wasn't it us squirming away, running, rolling in the mud, dying man by man? Don't we remember? One of the other things that it, we can talk about more mm. that I think poetry offers is an extension of empathy. So in one way we can mm -hmm. take a word like predator and question why are we using it, how are we using it, mm -hmm. what's the background of it. And then and another thing that we can do is extend empathy. And for me when I started with this project I was beginning with my own deep discomfort with this weapon and a discomfort that I couldn't fully understand. Mm -hmm. And where I didn't expect to go um, was to extend empathy towards pilots and their experience, though very quickly we realized they were having a unique and destructive relationship to these particular weapons. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, to imagining the life of the pilots' wives. So I imagined what might be a regular church service and then what it might be the experience of a woman within that church service. So this is called The Pilot's Wife in Church. She wears a kind of doily hairpin to her crown, her glory, the pastor says. She stands, and the hymn is sung along with the keyboard, electric guitar, and lead singer, heavy eyeliner, a tear in the voice. The pastor stands at the rail, waiting on sinners, scanning the congregation, what should she pray? That her husband's hands should stop shaking? That he should stop working on the Sabbath? That he should stop having those dreams, stop getting up and playing video games in the dark, stop turning out the lights and then talking, stop not talking, stop hating her for listening, stop killing those men who kill us, stop killing those children who cluster around them, Stop the women who we must watch, collect the bodies, parts of bodies, who are themselves sometimes nothing but bodies. Stop watching the bodies get into carts, into trucks, into the trunks of cars. Stop being paid for watching, for locating, for prosecuting, for firing. Stop fighting for the insurance to pay, for the VA to pay, for the government to pay. What should she pray? How can God answer? That's very beautiful mm. and moving. And I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that the idea of the human, the very idea of the fragility of human life connecting with the, the hard reality of warfare mm. and the uh, brutality that uh, is, is offered through drones and through the advances in technology is uh, sadly but beautifully uh, delivered in mm. in what you've what you've put together, mm. and this is a, this is, these are going to be part of a book yes. that is going to be published yes. in two thousand sixteen. Mm. Mm. Backwaters Press. Right. Yeah. Uh, what, where would you position your poetry, given these examples we've just heard, in terms of either a tradition or a uh, a style, or maybe both, a tradition and a style? Well, you know. Oftentimes, the, at least the American tradition has been the lyrical tradition, mm. and this is thematic. So it's unusual for me, and I think it's more unusual in American poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for that reason, sometimes Americans are, uh, American poets are considered not to be politically engaged. I would argue with that. I think every time you're speaking as an individual, mm. um, you're speaking in some sense politically. Um, and there's been certainly a lot done in terms of multicultural aspects of the politics mm. and poetry. Um, but in this case, to sit and reflect closely on a political issue that is still evolving, mm -hmm. that I would say is a bit unusual. It certainly was unusual for me. It was not clear to me that I had a book or that I had a book that should do anything except be my own private meditation. Right. And it was really friends and early readers mm -hmm. who said, no, we would. Yeah. We'll work with you on this, and we'd like it to go out. Mm. So. Well, the American tradition uh, is most notable, I suppose, for the beats and that yes. whole scene, which yes. became a, uh, an extension of the counterculture and the movement that I mentioned before. Interesting. Uh, uh, and, and certainly that seemed to, to have been an important political 
movement around writing and literature and the yes. humanization of uh, sort of social, lived social experience during the height of the Vietnam War. Yes, uh, yes. But I'm not sure that anything else comes to mind um, as thematic kinds of... Um, maybe not effects. an extended meditation, mm -hmm. you know, maybe Heart Crane, The Bridge, something like okay. that, but that's not maybe as, as politically fraught or mm -hmm. it doesn't appear that way to us right. now. Right. Right. Um, but you said something about the human up against the technological and of course I'm mm -hmm. looking at that all the way along, both the people who have the drones hovering over them, mm -hmm. the people who are piloting them, and also because I stayed close to my own experience, this sense that we are somehow allowing this to happen. That, that we're divided in our response to this particular technology. Um, and I think it, it has something to do with what you're trying to think about in terms of the, extending our reach. Mm. It can extend our reach, we can see so much more, but we're mm. still seeing in the yeah. same sense. Yeah. Like where surveillance and seeing are two different things. Data and yeah. wisdom are two different things. And I think that's part of the mm. problem with a weapon like the drones. You think you're getting so much more accuracy. In one way you are, mm. but in another way you are not. Yeah. Um, in fact, our policy is quite muddled. Right, and the, the question of course is the way that uh, a piece of literature, in yes. particular in a great tradition of literature, can, can offer a kind of critical redirection, if you like. Yes, I, I mean, I think we're considered sort of the last responders in, oh, in poetry, right? yeah. you know, right. to the Trojan War is good and done, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. um, and that's because sometimes of breaking news where you just mm. want information, information, information. Mm. But mm. as you step back from that and say, wait a minute, we have a lot of information, but what does it need, mm. mean? How do we assess it? How do we mm. put it in proportion? Then you start talking to historians. Where does this fit into the big picture? And then the poets are back there too, you know, having their responses. Mm. And I think a sort of full-bodied response, if I can say that. Like it's it's uh, allowing you a certain intuitional reach, mm -hmm. and then you're sitting with a sort of reflection in a very small space, right. um, allowing the terminology, the naming, the um, the stories you're hearing, all to sort of refract around mm -hmm. internally and being willing to get that on the page as well right. as right. you can. And then hoping that other people find it in some way useful. It was interesting to talk to drone pilots and ask them, mm. you know, mm. is this some of your experience? Um, and sometimes they would say yes right away, and other times they'll, they would say, let's wait and see. I'm not right. sure. Right, yeah. right. There's a, there's a point around uh, this kind of connection of poetry with technology that mm. seems to me to, to um, have been largely. Uh, devalued, uh, and uh, I would extend it, I suppose, to literature and technology, and literature and media. Although we have mm -hmm. a, a strong connection in cinema, of course, with poetics and yes. uh, seeking to give visual a visual, and uh, if you like, a psychoanalytic aspect mm -hmm. to uh, literature through mm -hmm. you know, visual culture. Uh, but not many people want to read anymore, do they? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how would how would you think? think that kind of proposition through to imagine having a role in a culture where mm. people are less and less inclined to read and less, inc less inclined to even reflection. I actually think we're reading a lot. Mm -hmm. We're just not reading the kinds of things that encourage reflection. Okay. And I think some of it is it's, it's so much easier to find that kind of counterbalance when we're uneasy to mm. go find mm. people who agree with us mm. and it sort of scratches the itch and then you read more and more of that and the volume goes up and the rhetoric gets more and more strained or hysterical mm. and you know then you feel uncomfortable from that and so it can kind of feed itself and you end up only looking at those kinds of things that that encourage you in the views you already held or the fears you already mm. had mm. Um, and uh, aren't really working towards even a narrative that has to be sustained or coherent it doesn't need to be a coherent narrative. Mm. You know, we're watching a political process that looks more and more like reality TV, mm. which seems to be like hyperbole and hysteria taken to a mm. ridiculous degree. Mm. So I, I do see the act of reading poetry and writing poetry as something that 
as creating a space that we're in need of, where we sit mm -hmm. with certain kinds of discomfort in the hopes, of course, of coming to something coherent. It's mm -hmm. not that we sh come to poetry to suffer. I think we come to poetry to sit with our suffering in a way that offers a kind of healing. And we read it for that reason, and we write it for that reason. Well, it's a beautiful turn of phrase to not particularly pleasant in some respects, mm -hmm. but the idea of sitting with one's suffering uh, the, the notion of solitude with poetry is yes. quite important, isn't it? Yes. I was thinking while you were talking, it's not the ideal reference, but the the way that Bob Dylan connected mm -hmm. uh, as a poet and then to yes. popularise yes. the, the kind of lyrics uh, and reflections that he had that really did take yes. up a lot of solitude. Yes. We were very internal yes. um, monologues, if you like, weren't they? Yes, and, and Leonard Cohen actually yes. was a poet before right. he started writing. I mean, his lyrics are constantly covered, mm. and I think it's because there is something right. in that inner refraction that we're in need of. And of course, we need music, and we're not sure why, and it's doing some of those same kinds of things. Mm. There are public poetry readings, but they're not rallies. No, no, not at all. There's something different. Yes, and it seems to be, uh, as it were, a kind of, uh, as, uh, I guess, last res last resort, as, mm. as I think you suggested before. Mm. Uh, we yeah. have, we've come to the end of, we've exhausted something about our nature. I think so, or we've come to the end of what we can say easily mm. Um, mm. to ourselves mm. or to this screen where people get more and more of their news mm. and mm. more and more carefully selected in one yes. way. Yes. Um, but even for most people where they first start in poetry is when they first fall in love and they experience emotions that they find mm. Mm. you know, uncomfortable, mm. Mm. pleasurable maybe, but also uncomfortable and new. Mm. And suddenly they want the new language. They want to enter into mm you know, a certain space and then they start writing and reading and mm -hmm. hopefully mm -hmm. it takes off from there mm. and expands. Yes. Uh, I, I sometimes uh, ponder just where the kind of literary and uh, aesthetic considerations of human existence uh, are played out in areas of design around new technology. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, it's, yes. it's, a, it's a major field and, and yes. there's been a little bit of literature recently about how uh, many more companies, particularly in the Silicon Valley and I mm -hmm. guess here in Boston, mm -hmm. are incorporating uh, liberal arts and humanities based uh, mm -hmm. scholarship and uh, educated personnel in their yes. teams of developers. Well, I think you may already be aware that um, Steve Jobs was very interested in Professor Reynolds at Reed College. We mm -hmm. went to Reed and so we saw he was already gone, but he had a huge influence and it was all, he was a teaching calligraphy right, right. and Jobs was fascinated by that and when you think about the how beautiful and how um, how important the icons were for mm -hmm. Jobs and mm -hmm. you know those things you see the hand of right. Reynolds yeah. who was teaching calligraphy yeah. You know? yeah. yeah so it's a wonderful example yeah. of, of something that we tend to say well it looks good but, but yes. not realize that there's a much deeper well yes. that's been drawn on yes. uh, for, for informing both the design and the thinking through of how the technology operates. Yes, everything about concision or elegance and effectiveness, yes. those right. kinds of things, right. yes. But also to use to use that facility or that utility in the technology in a way that mm -hmm. connects with the humanity, which seems to be the, po the very little point around which, humanity, uh, around which poetry seems to, to yes. make its point. Yes, I think mm. that's one of the places people would expect mm. that you're going to reflect on the deepest level of meaning. It has to make sense on a number of different levels at mm. once, or mm. it doesn't quite ring true. I've heard this phrase of truing your language to okay. experience, and I think poetry is definitely where people go, and sometimes you know, beautifully written essays or, or fiction mm. also mm. has that quality of truing language to human experience so that mm. we don't sort of um, become very good at a certain kind of technological maneuver that right. isn't offering us anything as human beings. And we can kind of lose track of that because for a while things are nifty. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and we have fantasies. With mm. the drones, mm. I believe we had a fantasy right. that we would never make another mistake. Mm. Mm. And that's not true. No, well, in the history of cybernetics, Norbert Wiener you know, really has been very, was very clear Mm -hmm. having been a brilliant uh, mathematician and innovator, then saying, well, hold on, there's a few things we don't want. And there's been a, yes. a, a number of people over the years who have made that similar kind of critical intervention yes. uh, in, in an appeal back to the human, if you like, 
-hmm. uh, and I wanted to talk to you, uh, so he was at MIT, long since passed of course, but uh, you're at BC, uh, yes. so am I, and, and we're in this kind of liberal arts environment, this humanities context, and I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about how your poetry connects with the, if you like, I called it a calling, yes. within the liberal arts and humanities. And yes. the, the kind of pedagogy, the kind of uh, claims that can be made uh, within within uh, that formation of liberal arts, and then what it produces mm. in a, potentially in young people in a student mm -hmm. that might be different from what other people mm. are doing elsewhere mm. around town. Um, well, one thing I'd like to say is that anywhere poetry is going on, it's we're sort of like the frogs of the. <laughs> the intellectual world, mm -hmm. if it's, that's being supported, then a lot of the ecosystem is probably healthy. And oh, okay. I, I like to think that's very true of Boston College. Um, and I think part of that is the Jesuit tradition, mm -hmm. that there was supposed to be this whole person, that, and that it was worthwhile to reflect on this. And there were people who were devoting their entire lives to some notion of this whole person. Mm. Um, even if there's disagreement about what exactly that means, issues like social justice and history and political theory or whatever, that's going to be taken seriously mm. at mm. a place like that, or there's going to be a bit of an outcry. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's absolutely essential. You know, obviously I think writing, you know, I'm in the English department and then the subsection of that, which is the creative writing. Um, I think what we're seeing is that the ability to to write from experience may be something that's under attack in the culture at large. Um, mm -hmm. The some of it's the texting, the technology oh, again. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. that's that's very easy. It's very fast, mm -hmm. um, and it's very good for telling meet me here. You know yes, that kind yes, of information yes. it communicates well, mm -hmm. but questions of meaning, maybe not so well. Yeah. So in that way, again, I think things like poetry and literature and the liberal arts are absolutely essential because otherwise things can just become, the technology can only right. facilitate basic uh, information and data, but mm. not wisdom. It's yeah. not going to yeah. give you wisdom. Well, and there's the, it's interesting to think about how education can take on that, that level of, if you like, responsibility. Mm. Uh, to to a larger project about what a society might look like once people have a, uh, a literary or poetic sensibility. Uh, yes. The kind of capacity to engage in a way with ideas and with um, their own sentience that that maybe they wouldn't find if they're just computing, <laughs> cr I think uh, crunching numbers all day. I think that's definitely true. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. even to do you know effective crunching of numbers, you think about Piketty's work. You know, mm, he's right. crunching incredible amounts mm, of data, mm. he and his, his minions or whoever's doing <laughs> yes, it for him. Yeah. And, but then he has to step back and find the patterns. Yes. So poetry in that sense is just stepping even farther back and mm. saying, what is the pattern? What yeah. worked for Achilles and works for the warriors now and will work for, you know, the peace time that we are all hoping for? Mm, you mm. know, that's the kind of thing that, that poetry has always hopefully thought about or right. it doesn't last. Right. In the last few minutes, I wanted you to uh, give us an opportunity to, to tell us about previous publications oh, of your own. Thank you. Very nice to see Well, now you're seeing the other side of poetry. I said that most of the time people are doing lyric poetry, and yeah. certainly Madonna Magdalene, which was a meditation on the two Marys okay. um, and desire. Mm. That's what poetry oftentimes does. You know, mm. it speaks mm. for those moments in human life that we all recognize, mm. Gr mm. great grief. Um, tremendous loss, uh, love, desire, points mm. where suddenly we're saying we want the language to do more. Mm. And then yes. uh, yes. hopefully poetry says, you know, here's, here's the way it can yes. do it without becoming a sort of propaganda. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Great. And I, and I think it, uh, it reminds me of some of, the, some of the moments of reading W.B. Yeats and you realize that yes. you know, he's not just talking about Ireland, he's talking about something yes. much more powerful. Yes, should mm. be working on several levels, should yes. be Ireland and his inner Ireland yeah. and the state of poetry <laughs> and you know yeah. a great deal else and hopefully mm. it'll continue to mm. reverberate every time you go back to it in a slightly mm. different way if mm. it's doing the right things. Uh, and I suppose the challenge for educators uh, who are also poets yes. is to to find a way of doing what all of us as educators have to do which is to generate a level of passion 
mm. uh, in, in the students so that when they leave it's not well that was a nice course that I no longer have any interest in this. Yes. That seems to me to be part of what what is interesting about this this project of um, the BC project if you like yes. of, and then your perspective on poetry. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I think that the, for me it the passions are all there. Mm -hmm. You know, the sense that it's sensible to mm -hmm. speak of them, mm -hmm. that there might even be a tradition of speaking in them and therefore refining your own understanding of your own passions, mm -hmm. that is more, you know, l less common. I think that's really my job in the classroom is to say what's already here that hasn't been said mm -hmm. or that hasn't mm -hmm. been expressed um, or is it feeling constrained to think of itself in a purely utilitarian manner, which I think is the real right. danger in education now, sure. is to figure out how to equip towards, as though we were creating widgets who yeah. could then fit yeah. into a larger machine. Right, and, and that seems to produce some, uh, some fairly serious contradictions, I think, in, yes. in the way uh, education is working. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Social, social questions as well as personal political questions. Right, mm. right, I agree. And I, I don't think there, at, at bottom, I don't think there needs to be a conflict per se, but of course I'm going to say that I'd want the meaning always pulling all these metrics and all mm. these skills, mm. Mm. you know, that to, to be equipped to be able to be of service in the world is mm. another means of love. So mm. there's there's no problem there, mm. um, unless you start thinking. It, never mind about the love. Never mind about the connection. Never mind about what are we after here. Just get good at doing what we're telling you to do. You mm. know, and mm. then I think we have a problem in education. Right, right. Well, I I can only say that I hope that you continue to have a a, a, a very uh, wonderful and full career, not only as a poet, but as an educator. Thank you. And Marcus. I think it's valuable to think of uh, Boston College, but also other people in, in this community of Boston being able to access the kind of work that you're doing and to uh, enjoy it and to uh, celebrate it, if you like, the, both the humanity and the questions, the criticism, the reflection, uh, and the, the possibilities of what it means to be human. So I, I, um, I, I want to thank you for being here and thank you for helping us to explore some of these ideas. Thank you very much, Mark. So that's it. That's it. Pleasure. And uh, that's it for tonight. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, this is Marcus Breen saying thanks again uh, from Boston Media Theory. And until next time, see you later.